Welcome once again to the course Life of Christ. We're still in class 50, now part B, and we're still working on some of the backgrounds of the Last Supper. So let's uh, read the text uh, out of Luke's version, and then we'll talk more about uh, some of the background of this event. Luke 22, beginning in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go on as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that their faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. So we look at uh, this story, a well-known story, if we've spent any time at all in the text. And we have to remember that as the disciples came to this meal, they were not expecting a new covenant uh, and all the things that Jesus said and did at this Last Supper. For them, they'd already celebrated at least two Passovers with Jesus, and this was going to be the third Passover, just another Passover. And, and they didn't really understand, as we've seen before, what was going to happen in the next several days. Uh, they probably thought they would celebrate this Passover, go back to Galilee, and continue on with Jesus' ministry. Uh, and so as they come to this then, what they're thinking about is a time with Jesus as a Jew, uh, as one who remembered Exodus chapter 12, 13, 14, the events of the Exodus, uh, the night of the Passover, the first killing of the lambs and eating them in haste, getting ready to go, um, the, the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians and even the animals there, how the angel passed over them because they were protected by the blood of the lamb 
on the doorposts. Uh, that was their mindset. They were, they were going to celebrate that event, tell that story. Uh, and then we find out as the story goes on, uh, Jesus changes everything yet again. Um, he builds on that story because there's obvious connections between uh, the story of the lamb and the blood and the protection and the, the exodus. Uh, there are strong connections to that and this new chapter of the story Jesus is writing. Uh, and he fulfills that story as this night unfolds and the next several days unfold. And then as as he always does, he gives uh, this event a greater meaning, uh, and it's held that meaning for everyone since then. Uh, that night changed the celebration of the Passover from looking backwards uh, to the Exodus to looking at Jesus and how he fulfilled the work. Now, there's several uh, depictions of this, in fact, many depictions of this in art and in history. This is probably the most famous in some ways, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, uh, painted on a wall in Milan, Italy. Um, and here you see that Jesus is pictured in the middle uh, of the, the, the dinner there, and the disciples all on both sides. You notice they're at a straight table, not the U-shaped one like we mentioned. So there's details that da Vinci obviously didn't get right on this, um, but this is uh, probably the most classic depiction of it. Uh, and then this was recreated by a group of Israeli soldiers, and they tried to get it exactly like da Vinci's. And so you notice even a lot of the postures and the placement are the same. Even the background is the same as well with the three windows in the background. Uh, kind of interesting to see how people have interpreted this. Um, they've had other ones, uh, depending on the country, uh, they may put different food on the table. Uh, they may have different messages that are sent with the picture, both uh, favorable and unfavorable, depending on who you are uh, looking at the picture. So it's interesting to see uh, how this event has been pictured or remembered by people. Uh, this is actually the place of uh, what many consider to be uh, the Last Supper. Uh, we know that this particular room and building are not the one that Jesus and his disciples used. Uh, even though it's called that today and is a, a site on uh, many pilgrimages, especially by Catholics. Uh, we know this because this building was built by the Crusaders in about the 11th century <laughs> AD, so about a thousand years after Jesus. But it's possible that it could have been on the location of the building where Jesus was, that house, that night, or at least very close to it in that part of the city. What we want to do in the rest of this particular video is to look at some of the celebration of the Jewish Passover as it's done today by Messianic Jews, who in some ways have the best of both worlds. They have the knowledge and of the traditions and the practice of the Jews because that's their background, but then they also believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and so they have the advantages of the Christian interpretations of everything Jesus is and did. And so these are some different uh, websites that you can go to to find out more about uh, the Messianic Jews' celebration of Passover as it is today. And we're going to walk through that uh, to see how they do it, uh, connecting the Jewish meanings and yet also with Christian meanings with Jesus. Uh, now, you have here uh, what's uh, a typical part, uh, the matzo, the bread, uh, the unleavened bread that was uh, such a big part of the very first Passover there and you see a part of the wine. Um, if you are interested at all, I thought it'd be fun to see what the world's largest matzo uh, would be like. And so you see this one here, 25 feet long, uh, 25 feet, one inch long, 41.5 inches wide, and 11 pounds. And there you have the guy holding up a regular matzo uh, in comparison to the large one there. So kind of interesting there. And then you have uh, typically kind of a ceremonial plate that has the six foods that the Jews ate ceremonially uh, to remember the exodus from Egypt. You have the names in English here uh, around the plate. Then you have the names in Hebrew there. It's the, just the transliteration of the M and the R and the O and the R there. Okay, the different Hebrew letters with different names, obviously. And then in the middle, you have the Hebrew word uh, for Pesach, which means suffering. Uh, and then here's just like a typical plate, kind of a ceremonial, kind of touristy, really, in some ways, with Pesach in the middle, and then the different words of the different uh, uh, foods around it. 
that you put on that plates and it's called the Seder plates and the Seder is kind of like the, the name for this dinner, this meal. Uh, so if you see it uh, in practice, here is what it might look like with the different foods. Then you have the candles as well and you have some of the wine that's used at the time. Uh, and so let me tell you just a little bit about uh, some of these different foods and what they represented. Uh, first of all, you have the maror, uh, which is kind of a bitter herb, like a radish, for example, uh, that symbolized the Egyptian slavery that the people remembered every time they celebrated the Passover. Then you have the zoroa, which is the leg bone uh, that symbolizes the Passover lamb. Uh, then you have the karoset, which is a mix of apples and nuts and spices and wine. And that symbolizes the mortar used by the Hebrews to construct the Egyptian dwellings or the pyramids, the buildings they had to build. Uh, and it's sweet somewhat because God is kind and he made the slavery more bearable. Slavery more bearable. Uh, then you have the chaseret. It sounds kind of like the first one, but it's different. Uh, again, it's bitter greens uh, with the maror as well. Uh, then you have uh, what they call the karpas, uh, a green usually like parsley, and that's taken and, and dipped in salty water uh, during the supper, and it represents the tears that are shed during the Egyptian slavery. Uh, we also have in the practice of the Jews a hyssop, uh, which is kind of like if you think celery and kind of a stalk kind of thing. Uh, that was also taken and dipped in the blood of the Passover lamb, and then used kind of as a paintbrush to paint the blood of the lamb on the door frame. Okay, and we know that hyssop made an appearance at the cross as well. Um, and with that blood, then they were protected uh, from the Passover angel and the plague of the death of the firstborn. And then finally, you have the Beit Sa, which is a hard boiled egg, and that symbolizes the festive sacrifice of biblical times. Uh, the Passover lamb is sacrificed during the Passover. Uh, the egg represents the grieving of the Jews, maybe for the loss of the temple later in their history, or also the grieving uh, for the suffering of the Jews in Egypt as well. Uh, now, you have a typical place setting uh, here uh, of a Passover meal. You have, again, at the top up here, you see here and also here, uh, the typical foods, the ceremonial foods, uh, and then the matzo as well, and then the four tiny cups of wine because there are four cups at four different times uh, of the meal that were celebrated, each with different meanings. And here is a place setting for the leader uh, of uh, the, the dinner, uh, and each, mean, each thing on the table has a different meaning as well. And the leader was in charge of helping facilitate the dinner and telling the stories and making sure everybody participated in the right way in the story. And you see uh, he has his four glasses here as well, have the wine and all that. Then you notice out here in the middle, there's a, a table with one place setting. And you wonder, well, what's that for? Do they just had, to, you know, not enough room, so they had to set out one extra table. Uh, the, the idea is that the Jews expected for Elijah to come back before the Messiah, like it says in Malachi chapter 4. And when Elijah arrived, because Elijah never died, so he was going to come back, when he arrived, uh, then they knew that soon after the Messiah would come. And so what this is, is a place setting for Elijah to be the guest of honor in case Elijah showed up at their house. Uh, and so then if the Messiah came soon after, uh, then perhaps the Messiah would come also and you'd have the honor of having Elijah and the Messiah in your house. Okay, so that's kind of a, a cool tradition as well. Now, uh, according to what I've researched on this, uh, the Messianic Jews have these different steps that they celebrate uh, during uh, this Passover supper, what became the Lord's Supper. And I want to just briefly tell you um, uh, what each one of these Hebrew names means or represents as a step in this dinner. Uh, the Bedikat Chametz is where they start out in the house and traditionally they search through the whole house, as they had to do back in Egypt, uh, to search for any leaven. And leaven represents sin, often, in the Bible and for the Jews. So the idea was you'd prepare for this celebration by getting rid of any sin that was in your house or in your life. And then you would take the leaven down 
uh, maybe to the synagogue and you would burn it, uh, get rid of the sin entirely. So again, a visual representation of what you're supposed to do spiritually as well. So you'd search for the leaven, Bedekat comments. Uh, then you had uh, Hadlakat Hadanot uh, would be the lighting of the Passover candles. Uh, again, you saw some of the candles. Then you have the, the Kadesh, uh, which comes from the Hebrew word for holy, uh, the blessing of holiness, and you would take the first cup of wine. And then you'd have the Urchatz, the first washing of the hands, uh, so that you could be pure as you ate the meal. Uh, then you have, uh, you'd eat the karpas, which is the, the green vegetable dipped in the salty water and give a blessing over that as well. Then the yachatz uh, is when you'd break the, the matzo in two uh, and you would keep one piece and then you would hide the other piece. And this other piece is called the afikomen. Uh, it's almost like saving the rest of that for later in the meal, almost like for dessert. And there is a question if this is uh, the piece that Jesus broke, the piece of bread that Jesus broke, uh, and saying that, you know, this is my body that will be broken for you, uh, and in a sense, maybe fulfilling the messianic hope out of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, uh, that in Jesus, uh, he would be the Messiah and do this. And the Jews say, just as uh, the bread, this bread appears twice in the meal, once now and then once later with Afikoman. Uh, then Messiah appears twice in history, uh, once in his ministry and once at the second coming. So that uh, could very well be the part of the meal that's mentioned in uh, the readings in the Gospels. Then you have the Magid, which is a telling of the story of Passover. And this would be when the youngest person at the table, maybe seated right by the leader, would say, why is this not different than all the rest? And then the leader would tell the story, probably with the help of others around the table, uh, of the Exodus. And so they, they recounted how God would help. And so, again, if you're a Messianic Jew, then you have that story that's now beginning that sets up then the later coming of the Messiah, who fulfills all of the things that were foreseen in the Passover. Um, so you have the telling of the story, and then you take the second cup of wine. Then you have the Ratzkah. Uh, which is the second washing of the hands and also a blessing. And then the matzo, the blessing of the bread, and eating it there at that time. So there's some question is, uh, how is that different than the first one? And I don't know exactly uh, how it's different. Then you ate the maror, the bitter herbs, uh, and then the korek, uh, which could be a combination. They could have taken the matzo and the, the, ma the mor maror, and kind of used it as a sandwich, kind of put the maror between the matzo and eat it kind of like a sandwich. And so all of these foods so far are ceremonial, kind of the symbolic foods that they would use to remember the story of the Exodus. Then at this point, you'd have the shulchan orek, uh, which is the festive part of the meal. And this could be other foods. And this would be where you might spend like two hours uh, just bringing out everything that had been cooked uh, during uh, the preparations for the Passover, and this is just when you sit back and enjoy. This would be like we might consider the Thanksgiving meal, uh, where you just sit around the table, you have all your favorite foods, you tell stories, you laugh, uh, you just enjoy being with family and friends, and like I said, this could take up to two hours, so the whole meal might be as long as three or four hours there just being together. Then afterwards, you have the tzafun, uh, which is when you eat the afikomen, and in this part, sometimes there's a game where the leader sends the children out and uh, they say, find the afikomen. Uh, we've hidden it somewhere in the house. And so the children run and they try to find it and bring it back and maybe one gets a prize for that. Uh, and then you have the barek, which is from the word for blessing uh, for Hebrew. Uh, and so after uh, you bless the food that you've eaten, uh, then, or actually you, you bless God for the food, um, uh, then you take the third cup of wine, and this is traditionally the one where you welcome Elijah as if he were present and hope that he might appear. And so some people think maybe this is the cup that Jesus offered uh, to the disciples. This is my body. This is my blood uh, poured out for you. Uh, and so again, maybe this connection again, I'm the Messiah that has come uh, just as was promised after Elijah. And so, and now, instead of looking to a future hope of the Messiah coming at some point in the future, now the Messiah is sitting at the table with you, 
that hope has been fulfilled. And so now we look back, not all the way back to the Exodus, we look back first to this night because the Messiah uh, fulfilled the promise. Then you have uh, what's called the Hallel, which is from the Hebrew word for praise. And uh, there's a time of singing. Uh, Mark 14, 26 says that they sang a hymn and they went out, uh, heading toward the Garden of Gethsemane. Now you wonder, uh, you know, if you like music at all, you wonder, is there a way to know what they sang? At least the words of it, we probably don't have the melody. Uh, and there are some suggestions that perhaps uh, Jesus and the disciples used one of the Passover Psalms as a hymn during this time. And we know that Psalms 113 through 118 uh, were the Hallel Psalms, the, the Passover Psalms uh, used. And if you look at those, there's one or two that may be uh, good candidates for that. that really tie together with the events of that night. Uh, one could be Psalm 118, the same psalm that was recited or maybe sung during the triumphal entry and also quoted part of by Jesus later on that day. Uh, but another uh, could be Psalm 116. So if you'll go with me to Psalm 116, we're going to read that psalm. And it's interesting to see as you read through this uh, how many details actually compare with or are strikingly similar to what's going to happen later that night. So Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me, which is exactly the garden as he's praying. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. And you think, well, he didn't save him with Jesus, but yet he did, just not from the death. He then resurrected him. And so he did save him in a, a better way. Uh, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Again, all things that he did after his resurrection. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And again, if you think about Yeshua, meaning salvation, Jesus, I will lift up the cup of Jesus. <laughs> and he's lifting up the cups this night in the meal, and then he drinks the cup of God's wrath later on this weekend. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Lord, not my will be done, but yours. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. <laughs> that must have been special of Jesus that night. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And he did fulfill every vow and some of them in the courts of the temple in Jerusalem, outside the city walls in Jerusalem. So I think that's a, a good candidate uh, for maybe the hymn that they sang that night, which would be really interesting if we could get even the music back on that. And then finally, uh, they have the nirtzah, the, the fourth cup of wine, and the end of the seder, the end of the meal comes. And at the end of the meal, typically the Jews had the custom of saying uh, next year in Jerusalem uh, for all those years they were outside of Jerusalem of course the Jews in this case were in Jerusalem they didn't need to say that uh, but uh, for many Jews from from 70 AD on uh, they really wanted to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem and as Christians uh, we might look at this and say okay we'll remember the Lord's death and resurrection and then we'll say soon maybe in heaven with the Lamb uh, with God in the New Jerusalem. So interesting customs that help us understand some of the background from a Jewish point of view of what this Last Supper meant to the apostles uh, and also to Jesus as he transformed the meaning of it 
uh, into the, the covenant, the new covenant of his body and of his blood. We'll see you next class.